Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Welcome to the inaugural Sickle Cell Disease Conference in Australia. I'm very excited and thrilled to be here. This has been three years in the making. And in doing so, we are going to run through our program. I just want to, to begin by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we work on, even if we're doing this virtually. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I would like to welcome Honorable Greg Hunt, Minister for Health and Aged Care, Honorable Mark Butler, MP, Shadow Minister for Health and Aging, Honorable Maria Bambakina, MP, Federal Minister for Power and our official ASCA Ambassador, Dr. Margaret Evans Scalia, ASCA Board Chairperson, ASCA Board Members, ASCA Executive Members, General ASCA Members, Representatives from Novadis, our gold sponsors, Sanofi, our silver sponsors, to all the invited presenters, to people living with sickle cell disease and their families, and all guests joining us from wherever you are during this period. Almost 13 years ago, I sat in an intensive care unit, pregnant, sick with an unknown disease, my family praying that I should pull through. And that was a very challenging period for us. I've shared this story before, and I've shared pictures of what happened during that period. It took almost eight weeks until I finally went home. And two weeks later, I, give, I gave birth to a healthy baby girl who we called Joy. Several years later, I came to understand that the unknown complications I had during my pregnancy would have been a result of the sickle cell trait or the sickle cell gene, which I'm a carrier of. 14 months after our baby was born, we received news that any parent would not want to hear from the doctors that our beautiful girl had sickle cell disease. We were devastated. We were depressed. I was depressed in a state of uh, confusion and not knowing what to, do, what to do. And in trying to find answers, I went back to university to study nursing for me to understand and know the world around the new uh, condition that my daughter was going to live with potentially for the rest of our life. And that was for me working in the business world for over 13 years. Studying nursing made me be in control of sickle cell disease. I read every day and, and uh, I understood sickle cell disease and some of the challenges that people living with sickle cell disease go through. I had the knowledge, however, I needed the human connection and I used to ask people around Australia and overseas how it was whilst living with sickle cell condition. I needed to understand the caregivers where they are coming from when they're trying to care for children living with sickle cell disease. I later realized that I could not find many people in Australia to support me or to support my family. During one hospital visit in Sydney's uh, Children's Hospital Westmead, just as we were preparing to move to Melbourne. And, uh, you know, moving to Melbourne is another story that uh, I've, I can tell you another day and I've shared the reason why I moved to Melbourne. I asked one hematology registrar if there were any sickle cell support groups in Australia. His answer was that as far as he was concerned, there was none. And he posed a question to me, which stuck to me for, for two years. Uh, he asked me why I could not try to start one myself. And um, after thinking about it for almost two years, that, those words kept ringing in my ears. I decided to do just that. That doctor or that registrar at the time was Dr. Pascal Barbaro, who's now a hematologist at the Brisbane Children's Hospital and is be one of our presenters during this conference. That was around 2012. In 2014, I started an informal support group on social media. In the same year, I sought help from an, an organization called Thalassemia Victoria, who, which was introduced to me or, or suggested by Dr. Barbara at the time to help me create a sickle cell organization. However, they encouraged me to join the organization instead. I was thrilled. I could not uh, you know, just imagine that people like myself and families would be supported by this organization. The only request I made was that we name thalassemia, um, change the name to thalassemia and sickle cell disease so that people living with sickle cell disease could also feel that they belong. And in 2016, we managed to change the name. 
I was part of Thalassemia and Sickle Cell Disease um, Organization for four years. And during that period, even if we changed the name, in my opinion and the sickle cell community, our objectives didn't change to support the people living with sickle cell disease. And hence in 2018, I invited families and friends impacted by sickle cell disease and reformed Australian sickle cell advocacy. We later invited our expert board members, including Dr. Margaret Evans Scalia AM, who I met during one of the events through Maya Segeria, who's also part of the ASCA group. We invited my, do- my daughter's hematologist, Dr. Ante Greenway, Dr. Nkongolo Kalumba, Dr. Shao Voon, and other board members. But these are the ones I've mentioned today are all participating in this conference. Our initial objectives were clear. We wanted to support people living with sickle cell disease and their families. We were walking the, the road together. We knew how lonely it was if you had no support. However, in doing so, we noticed the gaps that we thought we as an organization could not do much about apart from talking about it. We needed the help of the Australian government to help us change the system to support people living with sickle cell disease. So having an event like this, which we've planned for three years in a row, we want to learn and re-educate ourselves on the issues affecting people living with sickle cell disease. How can these challenges be alleviated from these families and people impacted? What can the government do to close these identified gaps? How can government support people living with sickle cell disease in Australia? We have heard from the experts that the prevalence of sickle cell disease has increased tenfold in the past 10 years. What is the government doing to prepare ourselves for the next 10 years? As we have more children being born with sickle cell disease. Our theme, Breaking the Barriers, is about getting rid of the obstacles that make it difficult for the sickle cell community to have access to all benefits of people impacted by chronic illnesses in Australia. To be able to have access to all the therapies available internationally that is otherwise not accessible in Australia. To be able to have our children screened at birth for them to receive early interventions and avoid having multiple surgeries, having a half a lung or, you know, complications that could otherwise be avoided if they are screened at birth. These are just some of the gaps that the government would help us close. All we can do is advocate and raise our voices, but the changes have to be in the hands of the government and the leaders responsible to to do all these uh, changes in this country. We cannot do this alone, and hence, when we started organizing this event, we sought help from organizations who have been doing this work for a long time. We reached out to Ms. Nicole Millis, Rare Disease uh, Voices CEO, Ms. Etha Renton, Swan Australia CEO, Ms. Catherine Holliday, CEO for Center for Community Driven Research, and Ms. Monica Ferris, CEO, Genica Support, uh, Genetic Support Network Victoria for their help. We also reached out to Thalassemia and Sickle Cell uh, in Victoria, New South Wales. And so today, I'd like to thank all these organizations supporting us with their selfless acts. You, the participants also, because without you, this event cannot be a success. And to everyone impacted by sickle cell disease in Australia and beyond, let us unite to change the face of sickle cell disease. I always say this in a funny way that let's make make sickle cell famous, but it's true. If it is famous, then you have a lot of people to have to support us and do a lot of research in terms of sickle cell disease. I would sincerely like to thank Novadis Australia for supporting our work for the past three years and in the years to come. They're also the main sponsor of this, organize, of this event. I would like to thank Sanofi for supporting our event too and for all the, the work they do in the, uh, looking out for people in the rare disease community. And so lastly, I just want to thank you all again for witnessing this um, event. This is a very, very special event for us and we hope to continue this in the coming years. And now it's my greatest pleasure to welcome our board chairperson, Dr. Margaret Evans Kalia, to give our welcome speech. Thank you so much. And sorry about the glitch from the beginning. Thank you, Agnes. That was wonderful. A really gorgeous introduction. Thank you very much. I welcome everyone as well. On behalf of the board of the Australian Sickle Cell Advocacy, 
I welcome you all online and thank you for taking the time to join. In the spirit of reconciliation, ASCA acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet uh, throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to Elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. We also acknowledge elders and representatives of other communities who may be joining us online. I join you from beautiful Wurundjeri country here in Melbourne. Welcome to the Honourable Greg Hunt MP, Minister for Health and Aged Care, and the Honourable Mark Butler MP, Shadow Minister for Health and Aging. It's really special to have you both online with us today. Our ambassadors, I also welcome them, including the Honourable Maria Van Vakenu MP and our invited guests. A very special welcome to the people living with sickle cell disease every day and to the village of people who care for them. You are the reason we are all here. And last, by no means least, I welcome everyone online today. Thanks for joining us. I first met Agnes after an event one night, November 2018, and she's already alluded to that special evening for both of us. I was immediately moved by her passion and commitment to help not only her own family, but many others as well. So when she asked me to serve on the ASCA board the following year, I couldn't say no. I think you'll find from the impressive program today, there are many people who cannot say no, which is wonderful. Since then, it has been an honour and a privilege to walk alongside Agnes and her team, as well as our expert board directors, to raise the profile of sickle cell disease clinical care, education and research in Australia and to find new ways to support and empower the people whose lives are impacted by sickle cell disease. It has been inspirational to say the least. ASCA is the first charity in Australia dedicated to those living with sickle cell disease. And in a short time, it has become a respected, influential voice around Australia and more around the world. I'd like to highlight a few of ASCA's key achievements in the last two years, ASCA has established support groups for people living with sickle cell disease, introduced online clinical education for healthcare providers, developed a growing membership in Australia with global connections to share knowledge and advice, created a national network of change makers and champions with state-based ASCA ch chapters in many, many states. They've engaged with leaders in industry and research, as well as in state and federal governments, and received funding through donations, sponsorships, and grants. ASCA has organised the lighting of well-known buildings and landmarks around Australia. This is very beautiful on World Sickle Cell Day, June 19th every year. I encourage you to make it happen wherever you are. And they've also worked together with clinicians on the ASCA board and our broader advocacy network to lead an application for newborn screening of sickle cell disease. This has now progressed to full review. And that's a real achievement for this organization in the short period of time it has existed. And here today, ASCA hosts the first sickle cell disease conference in Australia with over 300 delegates registered to attend. It's quite the list and it continues to grow. And you will no doubt agree these impressive achievements provide ASCA and the sickle cell community in Australia a tremendous foundation on which to grow and build for many years to come. The theme for this conference is Breaking the Barriers, a New Horizon. This is exactly what ASCA has started to do, but it will need your voice and your support to really make it happen. I encourage everyone to embrace and champion ASCO going forward and thank everyone who has been involved to date. This includes our ambassadors, members, and our generous volunteers who give their time, their energy, and their expertise, as well as the expert executive and the board directors. Thank you all for your time, your excellence, and your impact. Together, we can increase awareness and understanding of sickle cell disease in Australia. I'd now like to invite the Honourable Greg Hunt, MP, Minister for Health and Aged Care, to share a video message. Thanks, Agnes.
Well, welcome to the inaugural Sickle Cell Disease Conference for Australia. And I want to acknowledge and congratulate Agnes and Marguerite and Nicole and all of those who are involved in bringing this conference together and representing the needs of the more than a 1,000 Australians with sickle cell disease. You know the challenge. You've lived it. You've taken care of uh, your friends and family. Uh, there will be uh, sickle cell disease uh, Australians who are present at this conference and our researchers, our clinicians, all of you. So I want to thank you for that. Now, as we, we look at this challenge, it's part of a broader picture where we have prioritised rare diseases and rare cancers in Australia. Uh, in particular, uh, we've established the National Rare Diseases Plan with more than $3.3 million to focus on uh, in, uh, it's most especially awareness, diagnosis, treatment, recovery, and breakthrough new medicines and other forms of allowing people to either live with or move beyond their condition. As part of that, one of the most fundamental things is the research which we put into place. Through the Medical Research Future Fund, there's $614 million over 10 years for clinical trials, for rare diseases and rare cancers. This is a breakthrough new program and for sickle cell disease sufferers, it brings forward the possibility of new treatments, of new measures, of new things which can uh, be available to assist. Every day, we see different genetic conditions with different treatments that are being trialled, that are then being made available. So all of these are so fundamentally important. At the same time, there's $500 million over 10 years for the National Genomics Mission under the Medical Research Future Fund. And that mission is focusing again on the same themes of awareness, diagnosis, treatment, recovery, and ultimately breakthrough new medicines and therapies that can lead potentially to cure or to the capacity to live with the disease. These are fundamental opportunities. As part of that, there's McKenzie's mission. And McKenzie's mission is about ensuring that carrier screening, genetic carrier screening, is available for every parent over the course of the decade. And at the moment, 10,000 couples are being given access to uh, carrier screening uh, before pregnancy. And that includes, amongst the 1,000 diseases for which they are screening, <clears throat> sickle cell disease. So an incredibly important breakthrough. But then as we look forward, the national plan gives people a chance, a hope to look for ways through for disease. And I encourage you to be part of this, in particular to put forward for the clinical trials, to be engaged with the genomics mission. But also now we have the national blood spot application. That program is going through for sickle cell to be included. And I hope, I really hope, and I will lend all my weight and authority to doing everything we can to ensure that sickle cell disease is added to the National Blood Spot Program. Your great advocates, parents, patients, researchers, clinicians, or just friends, and I want to thank all of you for that work. And this inaugural conference is about hope and it's about treatment and it's about the very best sense of taking care of each other. I'd now like to invite the Honourable Mark Butler, MP, Shadow Minister for Health and Ageing, to speak. I greatly appreciate you joining us this morning. Oh, look, it's uh, such a great pleasure to be part of your inaugural Sickle Cell Conference today. It's a wonderful, wonderful achievement that you've managed to pull this together. I'm sure all of us wish that we were together in person, but such is life in the middle of a pandemic. I want to Thank you, Marguerite and Agnes, for the work that you're doing in this really important area. And also acknowledge the work of my friend and colleague, Maria Van Vakenu, who has been a strong advocate of sickle cell disease issues uh, and working with your organisation, I know as well. I'm not sure whether he's been able to do this, but I understand Greg Hunt, the Minister for Health and Ageing, uh, was hoping to send your conference a message. I hope that he does that. 
uh, and I want to pay tribute to the work he's been doing as Australia's Minister for Health during this incredibly difficult period. Obviously, I'm a member of the Labor Party and I wish that the Labor Party were in government, but, uh, but when I look across the aisle in the Australian Parliament, there is no other member from the coalition I would prefer to have as Australia's Minister for Health than Greg. He's worked very, very hard. Uh, he's experienced. Uh, he's intelligent. We don't always agree on everything and such is the nature of a vibrant democracy. But I want to pay tribute to his work and I'm glad that both the, the Minister and the Shadow Minister are able to present to your conference so that we can demonstrate our shared commitment as the two major parties of government to doing better in so many areas of our health system. I do want to say, though, while I want to talk a bit about the challenges that we face here in Australia and, and that your organisation is drawing attention to, that at a time of global pandemic, um, it is really worth reflecting on some of the achievements of this country. And two of the crowning achievements of Australia in the post-war era, so over the last 70 or 75 years, I think, are firstly the quality of our health system. Um, this is a great uh, labour legacy, I have to say, in many ways. Uh, one of the world's best medicine system, the pharm Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, was introduced in the couple of years after World War II by the Chifley government. The Medicare system uh, was something that we, the Labor Party, fought for for many, many years. And I'm glad to say I think now is permanently settled as part of Australia's social fabric. And we have a great public hospital system where every person in this country can go and receive world-class treatment for free. And there are many, many developed countries where uh, people are not able to have that as a right. Um, there are issues with our hospital system. There are issues with Medicare. But I think in a time of global pandemic, we really are reminded just how proud we can be of our public health system and everyone who works within it, whether as a clinician or, in your case, as an advocate for better quality care. The second crowning achievement, I think, um, and this is broadly accepted across the country, is uh, that Australia has really settled its place, I think, as the most successful multicultural nation on the face of the planet. Uh, millions of people have taken the often very painful decision over the last 75 years to leave their home, uh, to cross the oceans and to build a new life for them and their family here in Australia, literally millions of people. Uh, we know that there are more people who are either born overseas uh, or who have a parent, at least one parent born overseas, than really any other developed nation you can care to point your finger at. Uh, and we have made such a success of that multiculturalism. We are a proudly multicultural nation. The challenge sometimes is to blend those two crowning achievements together because we know for all the achievements of our public health system, the delivery of quality health care is not always equitable across our country. Um, it can be very different between the major cities and rural and regional Australia. It is very different often in different socioeconomic groups. The further you go from the centre of a major city, the less likely you are to be able to find uh, many different uh, areas of healthcare, particularly in the specialties, mental health, many others besides. So a more equitable delivery of healthcare is a constant challenge, which we must always be alive to. But there are often differences as well across different cultural groups. I know when I was the Minister for Ageing 10 years ago, uh, introducing a culturally and linguistically diverse strategy for ageing and for the delivery of aged care was seen by groups like the by, like FECA, the Federation of Ethnic Communities, Councils of Australia and a number of other multicultural groups is critically important because the type of aged care that different cultural groups uh, expect and, and, and rightly demand can differ can differ across the country. So blending those two things is a constant challenge as well. And it's not just the delivery of healthcare that needs to take account of different cultural and linguistic groups within the community, but it's also the fact that um, there are different disease profiles between different ethnic groups. We know, for example, that for multiple sclerosis, the further away you are from the equator, uh, the further away you were born from the equator, the more likely you are to have MS. So, so it is a disease that 
that afflicts Anglo-Celtic people more than people who grew up nearer the equator. And sickle cell disease is, is equally uh, something that, I, that, that is not typical among Anglo-Celtic groups, but is becoming more prevalent because of the nature of our proudly multicultural society. And that is something that we as public policy uh, leaders, Greg Hunt, myself, people in the departments, people at state government level, must continue to have an eye on. There is obviously uh, the broader challenge of rare diseases, uh, which is a bit of a misnomer because there's nothing rare about rare diseases as a group at all. As many as maybe 2 million Australians have a disease that we class as rare when considered in and of itself. Um, my understanding is we don't actually know how many Australians uh, have sickle cell disease. And when you don't know the prevalence of a disease, when you don't understand its scope and its scale, you are vastly limited in your ability to respond to it, um, to treat it, to understand it. You must have the data. And I know that that's a critical core objective of your organisation, and I'm sure something that you intend to talk about quite a bit through the course of this conference. I know particularly that one of your core ambitions is the expansion of the haemoglobinopathy registry that's based at Monash University. I'm very keen, particularly as we, as we lead into the next 12 months, to talk to you further uh, about that particular ambition. But more broadly, beyond just sickle cell disease, uh, there are endemic challenges generally in how we respond to rare diseases. There is, as you've pointed out in all of your documentation, the ongoing challenge of awareness about a disease that is, that is not common broadly across the Australian population. Awareness among patients uh, who might have it, but also among clinicians who are dealing with so many different challenges and such fast advancing knowledge about healthcare. Uh, lifting that awareness, ensuring that people receive a timely diagnosis, a quick, accurate diagnosis so that so they can access all possible available treatments is something we have to uh, be very, very conscious of. And one of the real challenges, I think, in all rare diseases, and you've pointed it out, is the ability to access innovation. We live in what I think is a turbocharged period of discovery because of the advent of big data, of genomics, of proteomics, and so many other wonderful innovations that are giving us access to, to healthcare and to treatments that only 10, 20, 30 years ago would have been unthinkable. We must ensure that those innovations are available to all, to all disease types. And I know particularly being able to access phase three clinical trials for sickle cell disease and other rare diseases is an endemic challenge. Uh, we must do better at that. Now, I'm very conscious that the government has acted in the area of rare diseases. Uh, the action plan, the strategic action plan on rare diseases is something that has bipartisan support. Uh, some of the MRFF rounds also have been focused on dealing with some of those or trying to respond at least to some of those endemic challenges in rare diseases, including around clinical trials activity. Again, that has the support of the opposition as well. But while I applaud what the government has done in those areas, there is always more to do. And I know that you will be seeking to discuss that at your conference and you will understandably be seeking to push the envelope in what the two parties of the government are thinking about uh, and developing as potential policies in this area. And I say your advocacy is just so important. Your, your insights, your expertise in this disease area is just so important to the development of good public policy. Your lived experience, the lived experience of those you represent is just so important and reminds us that the patient experience and the patient insights must, must be right at the centre of public policy development in all that we do in the healthcare system. So thank you very much. I'm just absolutely delighted to have been invited to your inaugural conference. It's a great privilege. Uh, I recognise it as such. I wish you all the best for the rest of your conference. And I really look forward to continuing to have a relationship uh, with your organisation into the future. Thank you, Marguerite. 
Thank you so much, Mark Butler, um, the Shadow Minister for Health and Ageing. Greatly appreciate your message and your acknowledgement of the bipartisan support. So that does align with Minister Hunt's message earlier in the conference. Uh, so thank you very much. I really appreciate too that you also mentioned the cultural diversity of Australia and the difference between socioeconomic groups. That is something that impacts this particular community dramatically. And so thank you very much for acknowledging that. We look forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you. Thanks for your thank time. Thank you. All the best for your conference. Thank you. Take care. See you. I think that was tremendous to have the support of two very senior leaders in government. So thank you, Agnes, for arranging them to speak and to contribute. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Evan Scalia, and I uh, just want to thank Honorable Greg Hunt, Minister for Health and Aged Care, and uh, Honorable Matt Butler again uh, for giving us those words and just the words of encouragement for us to continue doing what we do. We look forward to working with both of them, especially on the newborn screening. That's the very good news that we've heard that the government is going to support us, our application and see that through. So without further ado, I just want us to uh, enjoy these two days. And again, sorry for the glitch at the beginning, but we kick off our first uh, presentation today. And this morning we welcome Professor Wally Smith doing the first presentation as we start this conference again. So thank you so much. And Professor Wally Smith, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you able to hear me? Yes, please. Okay. I sent my slides and I wondered if you received them and if you could run the slides for me. If not, I'll share my screen. Okay. Great. Um, and I was asked to talk about pain management in children and adults with sickle cell disease. And uh, I have titled my talk, Reconceptualizing Pain in Sickle Cell Disease, which is important because what we've learned in the last uh, several years is that pain in sickle cell disease is not what we once thought it was. And what I've learned um, in the last few years is that there's more than we don't know than what we do know. I'll tell you what I know we know, and then I'll tell you what, what we don't know. <laughs> and then that will lend some light on how to treat pain and sickle cell disease. I wish I could tell you that we had it all sewed up, that we knew exactly what to do, uh, but we don't. And we're starting uh, to crack open some of the mysteries, and uh, we still have a lot of mysteries yet to solve. Next slide. So I'm going to cover these points, talk about what acute pain in sickle cell disease is, the phases of a vaso-occlusive crisis, try to describe pain in many, many ways so that you understand how different and how variable pain can be uh, between and within patients. Talk about some of the global differences in the way pain is being managed uh, and the pain is, being pre is presenting uh, around the world. Talk about chronic pain, both the types and frequency of chronic pain and it's much, much more complexity uh, to understand and to treat uh, than acute pain. I'm going to emphasize in my discussion a biopsychosocial model of pain, which is more than simply a biological being's response to a pain stimulus, but instead a biopsychosocial being's response to the world around them and in the context of the world. Uh, to, to their pain. I'm going to try to convince you that pain is much more than a unidimensional experience, 
and talk about what's called the neuro matrix of pain. That's an old topic, but I'm applying it anew to sickle cell disease and suggesting that there are many areas uh, of the brain besides the sensory area that uh, figure into the pain response. And that leads well into a discussion of the impact of pain on quality of life and vice versa, the impact of quality of life on pain. And again, vice versa, the impact of pain on psychological uh, function and the impact of psychological function on pain. And then the fuzzy area of treatment and what we can and cannot um, do uh, is um, very, very important. Next slide. So let's start by talking about uh, the vaso-occlusive crisis. Um, this is for your digestion um, at a later date, but I want you to pay attention to the red curve. And the red curve shows you that for a typical vaso-occlusive crisis, this is where the patient is in severe pain coming into the hospital. There is actually a few days ahead of time where they sort of know that something bad is about to happen. Typically patients sort of have a prodrome phase. Some call it an aura where they go, I don't feel right. I'm worried something is going to happen. And sometimes that is a false alarm, but many times it's, it's a very good uh, warning. Like there's a hurricane on the horizon. Uh, we're getting a flood right now in our region uh, and in parts of the United States. Well, there was a warning that that uh, flood was going to come. Uh, go back. Can you go back? Looks like it's on a timer. Just ignore it and go back. Thank you. If it does it again, just ignore it and go back. Um, at, the, at the peak of the pain, you can see that there are uh, severe uh, signs of inflammation. People may or may not go to the hospital. There may be fever. There's abnormal um, laboratory responses. Uh, and a number of other uh, biological uh, changes. And then uh, let's assume that you make it through that and you get out of the hospital. It's still not over. There are still abnormal biological responses shown in the bulleted points there. And so this resolving phase of the crisis is very important. And as, as many patients know, this thing can turn around again and you could have another hurricane. You may not be past uh, the worst just because you get past one crisis. And patients will talk about how this, this curve repeats itself. Doctors get frustrated when they see the curve repeating itself. I thought I just treated your crisis, why are you back? Well, the truth is, is that the patient did not make this happen on their own. This, these are biological processes that can be explained and we're still trying to understand them and they're represented by uh, these things on the slide. At the top are some of the psychological problems, problems with personnel in the initial phase, anxiety and fear, problems with the hospital personnel uh, in the established phase, not believing that they're in pain, patients being depressed because nobody believes they're in pain. All of these complicate the, the crisis. So this is a very complicated slide and anybody who has been through a vaso occlusive crisis will tell you this is kind of the way it feels. Next slide. The number of painful crises, the number of vaso occlusive crises that patients experience is unfortunately a predictor of how soon they're going to pass away. People who have uh, more than one this per year 
three or, or more a year, I should say, in the green line have a shorter survival probability, a worse survival probability than either people who have one to three crises per year in the yellow line or people with less than one vasoclusive crisis per year in the red line. This is from uh, the cooperative study of sickle cell disease. 3,574 patients followed over about 20 years, both adults and children. So this is an unfortunate um, harbinger of uh, the, the likelihood of survival uh, for uh, a, a large uh, uh, portion of patients with sickle cell disease. And we have focused very hard on trying to reduce the number of vasoclusive crisis as a major point of treatment for patients with sickle cell disease. So uh, let's take hydroxyurea, which I will not talk about today. Hydroxyurea, its main claim to fame is that it reduces the number of vasoclusive crises per year. That's how it got approved, and that's why uh, people take it, to reduce the number of vasoclusive crises per year. And sure enough, we now know 17 years later uh, from, the, from the start of the multicenter study for hydroxyurea, we know that we can prolong life with hydroxyurea. The only anticycline drug that prolongs life is one that is meant to stop vasoclusive crises. Next slide. African tribes have, oh, let's go back. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I think you need to go forward. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Yes, African tribes uh, have dis have given very descriptive names, and I don't know these languages, but look at the Ga tribe. They call sickle cell disease chewy, chewy, chewy. And look at the Fonte tribe. They call it Nui Nui. And look at the U tribe. They called it Nui Dui Dui. And it, it's a kind of onomatopoeia. That is, it sounds like the way it feels. Imagine a chewy, chewy, chewy feel on your bones and your muscles and your joints. And that's the way people describe it. It feels like somebody's chewing your bones, your muscles, your joints up. It feels like somebody's gnawing on you. It's relentless, it's repetitive, uh, it is severe. Africans were able to distinguish the severe from the not so severe type of sickle cell disease. We call that hemoglobin S and S beta zero thalassemia, the severe type versus hemoglobin SC and S beta plus thalassemia, the not so severe types. But Africans were able to see these phenotypical differences early on. They were able to tell that the disease ran through families and they were able to see that the parents were not phenotypically normal from the healthy adults. That is to say, it's an autosomal recessive disease. Both parents with the sickle cell trait who don't look abnormal have an abnormal child with homozygous sickle cell disease. So African uh, folklore and African history recorded early on some of the things that we've learned now from our biomedical science. Next. Next slide, please. Okay, now let's look at some sensory measures some things that we can do to try and measure pain. Next slide. The Pisces study, which was the study that we did, uh, showed that about 3.5% of pa patients uh, spent 
3.5% of days were spent in the hospital. 13.1% of days were spent not in the hospital, but still in a crisis. An additional 39% of days were spent in pain, but the pain was not called a crisis. And about 44% of days were spent not in pain. This was an important study because for the first time, we showed that most crisis pain was not treated in the hospital, but rather treated in uh, at home. So that's the yellow part of the uh, of the pyramid or the iceberg of pain. The tip of the iceberg, the 3.5 percent, was what physicians were seeing, and it gave them the impression that there was not that much pain in patients with sickle cell disease. And it gave the impression that all of the part of the iceberg that's below the water did not even exist. Because after all, it wasn't, um, it wasn't being seen in the hospital. If you look at the, the Ghanaian experience and the Italian experience, you're going to get a different experience than what you get in the United States. The Ghanaians use day hospitals for pain more than other regions. So what we were seeing in the US was that people were not coming in as much, but look at in Ghana, people came in a lot. And then look at UK and Italy, even less, so I'm sorry, even uh, more people uh, were coming in uh, to the hospital. So different pain is treated differently according to the healthcare system around of the country and the geographic region. And these geographic differences may correlate basically with how healthcare is organized and with how uh, opioids and other drugs are used, not necessarily with how much pain the patient is having. That's a very important point because the way we treat pain is different. Uh, depending on where we go, where you uh, see sickle cell disease. And we have to decide that the pain is separate from the treatment. So you can't call a crisis a healthcare visit. A healthcare visit is simply that. It's a healthcare visit. But a crisis could be occurring in or outside of the hospital. Next slide. Up, oh, you skipped to yeah. Thank you. You, this thing has a life of its own. See if you can go back. <laughs> it seems to to jump jump ahead a lot. Okay, forward one and stop. I'm trying to get just to the next slide. I gave this slide already. Gave that one. Thank you. That's the slide I'd like. So here is a comparison of Sub-Saharan Africa, the Americas, North Africa, and Europe for the percent of vaso-occlusive crises that actually led to a hospitalization. Guess who wins? It's actually Europe. Europe sends more of their patients to the hospital than either North Africa, the Americas, or Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think you can come up with all kinds of economic and medical and social reasons why that is true. Um, if you are more well-to-do and you have more resources, hospital resources, you're probably going to have a better chance of getting your crisis treated in the hospital. I found this slide very, very useful because when we published the Pisces data showing the experience in the Americas, the first thing we got back was, oh, I don't think it's that way in my country. Everybody that talked to me would say, especially the people in Europe would say, oh, I don't think it's that way in Europe. And as you can see, this, this study was uh, able to show uh, differences in the percentage of crises that led to hospitalizations. Next.
So we're doing now an ontology project. There's several of them uh, underway to try to phenotype pain. This one is important because it, it has its genesis in Africa. And you can see uh, that they phenotyped sickle cell disease pain as quality of life related, as a painful crisis, as chronic pain, as a vaso-occlusive crisis, and as sickle cell dactylitis. And we could keep going, could we not? We could talk about pain in the hips called avascular necrosis, hip and, and shoulder and um, knee pain. And we could talk about ulcers and on and on. So this is just a little sample uh, as of June 27, 2019 of the sickle cell disease oncology projects, ontology projects, bioportal descriptions of pain phenotypes in sickle cell disease. Next. Also, it's important to know that pain can occur in almost any part of the body. In the Pisces study done in the United States, we allowed 128 different possible locations to be specified for pain. And we validated 16 site clusters for pain locations. And we were able to use those clusters to talk about where pain and sickle cell disease is the most common. I'll point out to you that we were not the only one to come up with this idea. Outside of sickle cell disease, the American College of Radiology also did a similar project and found 19 site clusters in patients with arthritis. So you can see that for, for the work we did, which used uh, uh, 15,999 diaries to, to get these clusters, we were able to get a similar number of clusters as found in pain in patients with arthritis. Next. It, it's, it's, it's a little slow. I think it responds, but it's just responding slowly. What, what you get from this is on the left-hand side, a nice color diagram showing you the most, the hot regions of pain. Now the flesh colored pain, uh, regions are the hot regions. That's the low back, uh, which you can see in the posterior and the thigh and knee region, which you can see in the anterior. The anterior is on the left-hand side and the posterior view is on the right-hand side. And you can see where the hot regions are. People tend to hurt in their extremities and shoulders, in their back, uh, less in their arms and more in their legs. Uh, and this is a very in, uh, instructive diagram to show you where the hot spots are of pain. On the right-hand side of this diagram, what you can see is that pain is more often bilateral than unilateral. That's important because you would expect that if pain were merely from vaso occlusion in a, in a vascular region, that it would be unilateral as often as bilateral and that it would be mixed. That's not what you see in sickle cell disease and that's a clue to the etiology of pain and sickle cell disease and possibly a clue to how to treat pain and sickle cell disease. If it's more often bilateral, maybe the central nervous system and the brain are more often involved than we thought they would be just from a vascular uh, etiology of pain. Next slide. Now to the thorny issue of chronic pain and sickle cell disease. We just have now come up with a research definition of chronic pain and sickle cell disease. Although we've been talking about chronic pain and sickle cell disease for decades, we did not have it well defined. A group of us came up with a consensus diagnostic uh, uh, and research um, definition partly using the Pisces data set, 
And as you can see, we, we decided that there was pain on most days over the past six months, go back. Pain on most days over the past six months, at least one sign of pain sensitivity, and then three different kinds of chronic pain. We said there could be chronic pain without any other contributory disease, chronic pain with something like avascular necrosis or leg ulcers, and then chronic pain of a mixed pain type. So we allowed three versions or three types of chronic sickle cell disease pain. And that has been useful in order to phenotype pain and sickle cell disease and come up with better uh, subgroups that can be treated similarly. Next. Now this is important because chronic pain and sickle cell disease, again, this is from the Pisces data set, is a very common thing. On the right-hand side of the slide, you will see that pain of 51 to 75% of the days, or in blue, 76 to 95% of the days, or in, um, what is that, uh, light purple, 96 to 100% of the days. That occurs in 55% of patients. In fact, 30% of patients had pain almost every day. Go back. Thirty percent of patients had pain almost every day in the lavender uh, bar there. So over half of the patients had pain that is chronic. That's different than what people thought. It's not just about vasoocclusive crises. It's about chronic pain. That's what makes pain treatment and sickle cell disease more complex than we thought. This allows for the possibility of neuropathic pain, that is pain of nerve damage origin, as well as vasculopathic pain, pain from poor oxygen uh, dissemination, as well as inflammatory pain pain from tissue injury other than nerves. All of these kinds of pain mechanisms are likely contributing to pain and sickle cell disease and may explain why pain and sickle cell disease is often bilateral and not simply unilateral. Next slide. This is a cartoon I put together about 12 years ago to try to explain what I think is going on. Now the squiggly lines that are, that are jumping off the page at you, those are, are my representation of vaso-occlusive crises, okay? So imagine somebody going along and on the a horizontal slide is the number of months that they've been alive. Imagine somebody going along and having painful crises once or maybe twice or maybe three times per year, over and over and over and over again. And there, the severity of the crises may vary with each basal occlusive crisis. You can imagine the toll that's going to take on your body by itself. But then look carefully at the square boxes. You may not be able to see those, they don't show very well on this slide, but about 204 months, that is the age of 12 years, you start to see those square boxes come and pain coming from that. And the, the legend shows that that's pain from avascular necrosis or perhaps from ankle ulcers. It's about the time that you start to see those complications. That's a chronic pain. And on top of that chronic pain is the acute pain of the vaso-occlusive crisis, which does not still does not go away, but continues to happen. And then the triangles come in. 
the neuropathic pain, the damage that I just got through talking about. Go back. The triangles represent neuropathic pain, and they also represent the brain adjusting, that's called neuroplasticity, changes in brain fibers that result from years and years of uh, vaso-occlusive pain. And they actually change the shape of the brain, change the way the brain looks, and different regions of the brain actually become more or less sensitive to pain. And that we're still trying to understand, but we can image it these days. And then last, what if that patient were treated with opioids? The dark squares suggest that in and of itself, opioids may induce hyperalgesia, high sensitivity to pain, and a sensation of pain that is uh, higher uh, than if you had never been treated with opioids itself. Needless to say, when you stop treating people with opioids, they have withdrawal, and that's a pain-like sensation as well. So I wish I could tell you there was a simple, easy way to approach pain and sickle cell disease. But if you look at these four mechanisms of pain, you can tell me, I can, I can tell you, and you can see that it, it's not a simple uh, thing to approach. I won't go through what's up top. Up top is just telling you that frequency in sickle cell disease increases with age. That's the main point for that, for those numbers. Next slide. This paper has not yet been published, but it is about to be published in the highest rated journal for pain. It's called Pain. <laughs> That's the name of the journal. And this is by one of my mentees. Her name is Nitya Bakshi. Again, using the Pisces data set collected more than 10 to 15 years ago, she reanalyzed it and came up with a phenotype based on how often and how severely people hurt. This is just another way of trying to describe pain and sickle cell disease. Box one is people who basically don't hurt a lot. And when they do, it doesn't vary that much. So they probably have a one or a two out of 10 pain whenever they hurt. And mostly they have no pain. That's box one. That's easy to understand. Box two is basically people who hurt all the time. That is, they are at eight or nine every day, most days, and that it doesn't vary. If it's an eight the first day, it's gonna be eight the second day, and then maybe a nine the third day, and a seven the fourth day, and so forth. So those people, we call them high temporal dependency. Put another way, they just hurt mostly all the time. Those people have a lot of stress. Those people have trouble coping with their pain they have higher catastrophizing. Catastrophizing just means, oh my God, I'm hurting. I don't know what's gonna happen next. Any patients out there that can uh, relate to that. It's just an anxiety about the pain itself. I don't know whether I'm gonna need to go to the hospital. I worry about that. How about cluster three? In these, in these patients, things vary. They can be high one day, low the next. You can have a hospitalization and then nothing goes on afterwards, or you can have three hospitalizations in one year, also causing you to catastrophize and stress, and also causing you to have difficulty with coping. And a lot of patients fall into that category. So these are, these are done with mathematical formulas called clusters. And these three clusters may be useful to try and describe patients with sickle cell disease of different pain phenotypes. More when we get the paper published and we start trying to use these to do trials and pick uh, treatments. Next. What if you treat with hydroxyurea? Up top is the pain pattern among people treated with 
uh, hydroxyurea who responded very well to it. Those are the people in the bottom versus people who didn't respond as well. And what this is illustrating is only the group that responded very well to hydroxyurea got any pain relief. If you were a moderate responder, a low responder, or even what we call a high responder, your pain level did not change that much, even on hydroxyurea. Now, remember what I said about hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea is a drug to treat vaso-occlusive crises and prevent them from recurring over a course of a year. What hydroxyurea is not, according to this diagram, is not a drug for chronic pain. Only the people who responded a lot to hydroxyurea got any relief from their day-to-day -day chronic pain. Let's go a step further. What if you did a bone marrow transplant and cured the patient of sickle cell disease? Would that cure their pain? Maybe, maybe not. In the bottom left is how long it took the average person to come off of morphine after being cured of their sickle cell disease with a bone marrow transplant. And what you can see is that it takes months, sometimes greater than one year, before they're down to almost no morphine required. Now, if sickle cell disease were simply a disease of vaso-occlusion, I would have reasoned that immediately upon getting a transplant, they would be able to come off of morphine. That is not the case. Now you can say, well, they were just dependent on the morphine, but should it take you 12 months to wean somebody off of morphine? I think not. Rather, I think what is going on is that pain is a complex phenomenon and the pain experience continues, go back. The pain experience continues even though the, the vasoactive uh, disease, go back please, the vasoactive disease is cured. Go back to the previous slide. Now in the bottom right, In the bottom right is a group of people who had um, the their pain characterized or phenotyped. And let me go through those four, four groups. The patients who had, and all of these people underwent a bone marrow transplantation. And the left-hand group is the people who had acute episodic pain only. The next group is the people who had acute episodic pain and chronic pain subtype one, that is chronic pain without any complications. I'm gonna call that neuropathic pain. The third group, acute episodic pain and chronic pain type two, that is chronic pain with ankle ulcers, or avascular necrosis and so forth. And then the, light, the gr group on the right is chronic pain mixed phenotypes along with acute episodic pain. Now in the bottom is the percentage of people who had continued to use pain, uh, use opioids after their, after their transplant uh, occurred. And you can see going from left to right, it was 0%, 100%, 56%, and 83%. Let me interpret this. The 0% is people who didn't have any neuropathic pain whatsoever. Subtype one, probably phenotype one that I showed you a minute ago. The second group is the people with neuropathic pain and sickle cell acute pain and nobody 
was able to stop using opioids. Their pain just continued on, even though you so-called cured their sickle cell disease. So I'm careful to use the word cure because we didn't cure this person, these people's pain. The third group had ankle ulcers and a lot of them were able to come off, but the fourth group had a mixture of ankle ulcers and neuropathic pain and more of them required opioids. Put another way, the more likely you have neuropathic pain, the less likely you are to come off of pain medicines, even if you get cured. And that's what this slide is showing you. The signaling processes for pain and sickle cell disease are complex and are bi-directional. The pain actually can come from the brain down to the affected part and not just from the affected part up to the brain. So there's ascending pathways and descending pathways and there's neuroplasticity, that is things can change according to structure and function. And we don't, continue, we don't even understand all this quite yet, but we know that the signal processing is bilateral. And we think that these uh, is studies showing that pain continues despite the cure of sickle cell disease is important to show that the brain itself is producing pain signaling. Next slide. And I think my time is about up. So I'm going to end by talking about the biopsychosocial model. If you haven't heard me say anything, these next two slides are important. Stop thinking about pain as a stimulus in a blood vessel that's causing a signal to go up to the brain. We know that's not all that's happening with pain. Think instead of pain as the duality principle. That is, the pain is not simply its, its input. The pain is a combination of input plus environment plus the brain stimulus. You, you had it right. Go back. Yeah, you go forward one more. I'm sorry, these are giving you so much trouble. So think of pain, this is the slide I wanted to talk about. Think of pain as the duality principle. It's, it's the biopsychosocial model. Pain is not simply a stimulus in a, in a response. Pain is in a complex environment. With that, I'm going to stop and take some questions. I have more slides, but I think I'm out of my time. At our next session is uh, just an education session, Professor Wally Smith. If you want to continue with your slides, you can do so. Well, I, I had a slide on, on the pain neuro matrix, and then I think I had a slide on uh, Let's let's go forward. Thank you. Yeah, stay stay with this slide here. Don't yeah, let's not use this slide. This slide takes too long to explain. This slide is important because it shows you the kinds of pain on the right-hand side that people have and where the pain may be coming from. So look at this, when people had the neuropathic and neuroplastic pain, central pain or, or brain stimulated pain, they use words like cold, spreading, uh, aching, um, and very, very uh, different words than one might use for a vaso-occlusive uh, peripheral pain uh, uh, stimulus. So it is important how people describe their pain. And the more we 
capture how people describe their pain and where their pain is and over what period of time it occurs, the better we'll be able to come up with, with treatment paradigms for what to do with pain. We have a very sort of pat and dry treatment paradigm for pain in the United States that is vaso-occlusive crises. We do not have one for the most common pain in sickle cell disease, and that's chronic pain. In the United States, we use opioids. We try to get them to the patient very quickly. We have a guideline that says within 30 minutes of coming to the emergency department, the pain should be treated with an opioid and they should get intravenous fluids. But we don't have a similar guideline for what to do if the pain is chronic. And the, the, the trials have simply not been done. Drugs that could be tried include gabapentin, uh, any of the so-called anti-seizure medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, drugs like ketamine that um, uh, work in the central nervous system, even drugs like cannabis that are central as well in their uh, etiology. All of these have yet to be tried in randomized controlled trials in sickle cell disease, and they need to be. But we are simply at the very beginning of our understanding of chronic pain and sickle cell disease. And again, chronic pain is the most common pain uh, in sickle cell disease. So let me stop there and take some questions. Thank you so much, Professor Wally Smith. Uh, on the panel uh, this morning, we've been invited one of our care, uh, sickle cell warriors who's uh, Shane. Shane lives in Queensland. He's got a few questions that he wanted to ask you. Shane, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, Professor Smith, thank you so much for your uh, formative presentation. It's absolutely been uh, educational and an eye-opener, really. Um, very quickly, I'm a 40-year-old uh, young male with um, sickle cell disease, and I've had this. Uh, I've had multiple crises, as I guess many of our uh, attendees who would like to know more about um, pain management in in chronic uh, sickle cell conditions. Professor, my question is very simple: Do you see a differentiation between sickle cell pain as such? compared with people with other chronic medical conditions. Now, I understand that some things in sickle cell uh, patients with respect to pain management and treating cr uh, crises is very specific. But from your experience, is there a differentiation? A slight differentiation, and let me explain what I mean. We use the term... Uh, non chronic non cancer pain. Have you heard that term? Chronic non cancer pain. Chronic non cancer pain does include sickle cell disease, and people distinguish cancer pain from non cancer pain because in cancer pain, you know you're going to die usually, and so you just kind of throw the kitchen sink at it because they're gonna not gonna live. In chronic non-cancer pain, the patient's going to live for quite some time. You'd like to avoid addicting that person if you can, and you'd like to have them improve their function because they're going to live for a long time. Sickle cell is similar to other non-cancerous chronic con pain conditions, but here's how it's different. The vascular component, the vaso-occlusive crisis component, sits on top of the chronic pain component. The cartoon that I showed you with the electricity and then the smoother lines, I can't say it any better than that. Take the electricity away and you have low back pain, you have temporal mandibular joint pain, you have pelvic pain, and all these other conditions that make up non- cancer pain. 
People like to treat low back pain and talk about fibromyalgia and talk about these other conditions and throw sickle cell in there. I, I strongly object to that because they are eliminating the possibility of somebody having a vaso-occlusive crisis. The things that I would do for the non-cancer pain apart from the vaso-occlusive crisis are very different than what I would do for the vaso-occlusive crisis. So we're working on chronic pain and working on acute pain and sickle cell disease. What patients with sickle cell disease deserve but are not getting is the benefit of the knowledge we have of how to treat chronic non-cancer pain. Multimodal, multidisciplinary approaches, behavioral plus medical plus physical therapy, all those different approaches are valid and should be tried in patients with chronic sickle cell pain. But they are not going to get you out of an acute vaso-occlusive crisis. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for answering that, uh, Dr. Smith. Professor Smith. I've just got one quick question, uh, follow-up question from that also. Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned about the trials for uh, chronic pain, which uh, as opposed to vaso-occlusive uh, crisis or vaso-occlusive related pain. And the trials for these chronic pains um, weren't done or haven't been done. Is there a roadmap for something like this? Is there a roadmap for trials for chronic pain being done at some point in, our, in the near future? Unfortunately, the first thing we have to do is describe the animal before we can kill it. We're still describing the animal. What I gave you was a state of the art description of chronic pain and sickle cell disease. There's no better description of what I just gave you in the United States. How do I know that? Because we just ran the conference where all the experts came together and we had this discussion and I heard nobody present a better descriptor than what I just gave you. Everybody, it's a giant elephant. Everybody's trying to bite a little piece of the elephant. And until we describe the elephant, we can't kill it. In other words, when you go to do a trial, you have to have a specific target and a specific outcome of interest before you try to apply a therapy to it. So let's say we were going to do a multimodal treatment trial for chronic pain with sickle cell disease. What we would need is to have a phenotype of pain that we're trying to treat and a way of measuring whether that phenotype has improved or not. We're still developing that phenotype and still developing ways of improving it. I think pain intensity and pain frequency is a good start, but as I just showed you, that's not the whole thing. How many places you hurt is important. Whether you hurt uh, stinging or, or, or aching or whether your pain is, is stabbing is important. How depressed you are because of your pain is important. Your function is important. So if you don't measure some of those things and you try to do a trial, you may miss the mark. We are trying to get there Please bear with us, patient with us. I hope within the next four to five years, we will mount a trial of well-described, well-phenotyped pain that is chronic in sickle cell disease, and we'll be able to show some differences and some, some improvements in treatment. While we wait for that, let's use the model of chronic pain in diseases other than sickle cell disease, but let's not throw out the fact that these patients have to have opioids and have them quickly when they're in a vaso-occlusive crisis and they need to be in the hospital and they need to get fluids and all the things that we do for a vaso-occlusive crisis. I think the problem is that pain doctors don't like sickle cell disease because it's not neat. It's just not pretty. It's not easy to solve. And so we can't turn it into fibromyalgia. We can't turn it into cancer. 
We can't turn it into rheumatoid arthritis. No, it's sickle cell. Thank you, Professor. Hi, good, good day, Dr. Smith. Um, okay, I don't know why my camera's not on, but um, you mentioned, you know, first of all, thank you and, and all the participants who worked on this research for sickle cell pain and, and the process of beginning to describe it um, so that the issues can be resolved. I'd like to know, was there any discussion on starting to recommend non-opioid pain medications? Yes. For yes. acute pain, because everything is yes. morphine and dilaudid. And, yes. you know, I think we need to move away from that because one of the things that I've learned is yes. that doctors were, are not aware that if you don't have the receptors for morphine, it won't work. And so uh -huh. when patients are in the emergency room screaming, it's not helping, it's not helping. And rather yeah. than give the patient something different, they're increasing the dosage and increasing right. it to different levels. And then the whole, you know, this is a drug seeker, drug addict thing starts. Yes. yes. The patient yes. starts, but it was never looked at. Maybe this medication isn't working for the patient. Um, I think that, you know, especially for people who are educated by the CBOs to go to the emergency room as soon as they know that this could escalate um, from, you know, a mild crisis into, into a severe crisis, that if they go in and get treatment, that non-opioid medication should be should be tried first so i'd like yes. to know what your recommendations for non-opioid medications are and also has there been talk about using this modality in pediatrics um, instead yeah. of giving babies and giving children opioid medication um, yeah. because by the time they reach 16 we're already seeing problems in those meds not working for them well said the World Health Organization has something called the analgesic ladder. Basically, they say, let the punishment fit the crime. If the pain is mild, use mild pain uh, relievers. If it's moderate, use moderate pain relievers. If it's severe, use severe pain relievers. An adaptation of that would be start out with the least addictive and mildest form of analgesia. What would that be? That probably would be oral, non-steroidals, Tylenol, y'all call it, uh, there's another word y'all call it, aceta something. <laughs> I can't even say it, the Brit name for it, but we call it Tylenol, acetaminophen. And, and then work your way up. There are actually mid-level uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, Ketorolac is a good example of one that can be given parenterally. And then mild oral um, opioids like um, codeine or maybe oxycodone. And then the big guns, morphine, um, hydromorphone, and um, fentanyl. So let the punishment fit the crime is my philosophy. And uh, somebody asked about tramadol. Tramadol is, some people think of it as an opioid, but it's somewhere in there along with ketorolac. It's moderate, not severe in its, um, in its uh, uh, capacity for, for analgesia. But whatever, what the least thing that you need to make it work. So in a young child, you may not need opioids at all, and you might only need tramadol, or a non-steroidal, parenteral non-steroidal, uh, such as ketorolac. In an adult, sometimes you gotta go further, but adults who don't hurt very often, you may still not have to go very far. So I agree with you, it should not be automatic, um, especially in people who um, you know, don't come often and are not in severe pain. We haven't gotten our protocols down to that level yet, but we are working on getting individualized. We push this in my center. Individualized pain protocols according to what works for that patient. And we have a recipe book that the patient can, the doctor can look up when the patient shows up that tells exactly what the formula is, exactly what the recipe is, 
for that individual patient, all the way down to the dose and the frequency. Sometimes the doctors think we, we're giving too much. Sometimes they think we're giving too little, but we go, this is what worked the last time. Why not try it? Unfortunately, when patients do that, they are suspected. The doctors don't trust the patient to tell the, the truth about what works for them. And that's unfortunate. There's a lack of trust uh, sometimes in what the patient's knowledge is about their pain. So I'm agreeing with you 100%. Somebody asked, is Ketorolac available in the emergency department? It is in ours. Uh, I don't know about all hospitals, but we can give Ketorolac. Somebody asked about cannabinoids and you have a legal issue with cannabinoids. Uh, we just are starting to get some legal in the United States of medical marijuana. And we only have one state that has legalized recreational marijuana, maybe two. Uh, I, I haven't kept up with it. So I cannot give can uh, cannabis to my patients legally uh, as of today. Uh, Professor, um, we've got a question here from a Natalie. Um, how can we leverage technology to document uh, what can help to develop treatments to manage pain? Man, that's a great question. So I guess you're talking about neural networks and uh, l machine learning. Next level. Um, yeah. You can put what I know about neural networks and machine learning in a very small neural network. <laughs> My brain is pretty small. I am ready to learn. Uh, if I understand machine learning and neural networks, you need a whole lot of patience to train the machine. Don't forget, this is a rare disease. It's going to be tough to find a thousand patients to train the machine. If we did that, I imagine we would get a really sophisticated algorithm back with some weights on it to tell us um, patterns of pain. But you need to, to have the neural network work. You need a lot of cases. That's the one thing I know about neural networks. You can't just have a few cases. Wonderful, thank you, Professor. Well, I guess we've got time for one more question. Um, and uh, KW has asked, does pharmacogenetics help to personalize pain treatment? Absolutely. And I have, I have uh, asked for funding to understand. Now, let me give a quick aside. 410 genes are responsible for the pain experience in sickle cell. 410, not one, <laughs> not three. So you can't simply go and, and know about the receptor uh, sensitivity to pain, uh, which is one of the genes, and it's dramatic. When that is uh, uh, present, it is dramatic. You can give the patient, and I've done this, hundreds of milligrams of morphine, and they don't flinch. And I'm, I'm you know, my, my, my nurse is fainting, and I'm fainting, and the patient's just sitting there reading the magazine, nothing going on. But that is not what I find to be common. So we have to understand all of the genes that somehow influence opioid metabolism, opioid sensitivity, sensitivity to pain, and the like. And the, the last count, it was 410. So that would be a huge genetic study to try to figure all that out, how, how that works together, to how those cluster together. I still am in favor of it. Again, machine learning, neural networks, I'm in favor of that, especially if we can throw something other than sickle cell in the mix so that we start to get these patterns like you would see in fibromyalgia and um, in uh, pelvic pain and TMJ and other chronic non-cancer pain. That's where I think the research needs to go is to throw sickle cell patients with chronic pain and not a vaso-occlusive crisis, throw them in the mix along with some of these other pain conditions. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Professor. Um, it's been an honour and it's been wonderful hearing your um, your uh, thoughts and your presentation and uh, it's been absolutely educational, informative. Um, thank you very much. Agnes, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wallace Smith. It's always uh, lovely. You can see the, the, the information on the chat box and also on the Hoover app. Your presentation are always very informative and uh, we look forward to uploading this. Somebody asked whether you can see this. Yes, give us about uh, seven days to 14 days. We're going to upload these uh, sessions on YouTube. You can watch them again. We just want to thank you again for re-educating us and to learn more about sickle cell disease. I was actually intrigued about one of the slides that you showed in terms of a hospital hospitalization between different ethnicities. And uh, I wonder why, or wonder maybe that's the reason why some of the people I've seen in different chat boxes say people from an African region are not really believed in terms of uh, the pain uh, tolerance compared to a fellow, you know, Anglo uh, Saxon. Uh, yeah, people. that's so right. Because, yeah, that's yeah. right. Absolutely. Hmm. So maybe that's why. So it's, it's a very unfortunate, but uh, it's, a, it's a mystery. And you, I'm sure that's what uh, the scientists and you clinicians are doing in terms of more research. We just want to thank you again for presenting for us and we look forward to for you joining us for all the other sessions for the next two days.